everyone. Uh, my name is my name is Husna Abdul Hamid. Um, I'm the alternate chairperson of the Young Mi'kmaq Task Force, and on behalf of the Task Force, I would like to welcome you to our inaugural Young Mi'kmaq Annual Forum, titled "A Smarter Business." I hope you're excited as I am to hear from our panelists this evening. Uh, we are lucky to have three of them in our session, as I am sure they are very busy individuals. So thank you. Uh, for the benefit of our audience, I would like to first introduce you to the Young Mi'kpa Task Force. Uh, these, sorry, these are the faces of the Task Force. Uh, we are made up of Mi'kpa, Mi'kpa members, uh, me members me under the age of 40 and below. We are all proud to belong to the only Malaysian professional accounting body, which incidentally just celebrated its 63rd annual anniversary on last Monday. So happy anniversary, MIPA. Uh, the Young MIPA Task Force who works with the Institute to foster a strong community and to create activities and events, such as this one, to serve the interests of the young members while allowing them to build their networks with other members and peers. The other flagship event for the task force is our Coffee Talk series, which first started back in 2017. Uh, this year in April, we were able to have a Coffee Talk on the question of whether it is a good time to invest. The task force is also active in MIPA candidate uh, sharing sessions, where a few of the MIPA task force members have shared their experiences about the program and tips for completing the modules. If you want to be part of the Young MIPA community and are keen on making a difference, um, and working closely with the task force, we will be more than happy to hear from you. You can reach out to any of the task force members or our organizers today, Eileen and Shanta. We are all very pleased to bring this annual forum to all of you, and we hope that um, you will find it insightful and a beneficial one. Before we get started, some quick housekeeping. Kindly ensure that your microphone is muted to, to avoid any distractions. We will be having a group photo before the Q&A session. Um, it would be great if everybody could switch on. Uh, so we hope you won't mind turning on your camera for a short while later if you're able to. If you have any questions at any point during the forum, please type them in the chat box. We will address them during the Q&A session. After the Q&A session, there will be an exclusive networking session where you'll get to meet and mingle over casual conversation with our panelists. Uh, each panelist will be assigned to a breakout room. You may join any room uh, which you want and are free to mingle and move around as you please. Okay. Now, to kickstart the forum, uh, allow me to introduce the mor moderator for this evening, um, Chairman of the Young Mi'kpa Task Force, Peter Lim. Now, Peter is a partner attached to Deloitte's Audit and Assurance Division. He is also the Audit Group Leader of Japan Service Group in Deloitte, Malaysia, and he is also part of Deloitte Private. Peter has, has spent the past 16 years focusing on statutory audits, reporting accountants for IPO, and special audit assignments. His clients include organizations in the property development, plantation, trading, hotel, and hospitality industries. Peter is also an approved company auditor under Malaysian Companies Act 2016. Now, apart from being the chairman of the Young MIPA Task Force, Peter is also chairman of MIA's Digital Technology Implementation Committee and Public Practice Committee Working Group. Now, without further delay, I will now pass the session to our moderator for today. Peter, the screen is yours. Thank you, Gustav, for the introduction. A very good evening to our esteemed panelists, Clarence, Daryl, and Rico. Thanks for agreeing to uh, be the panelists in our inaugural uh, forum. And a very good evening to our MIGPA Council members, fellow Young MIGPA Task Force members, fellow professionals, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for joining us for today's virtual forum organized by the Young MIGPA Task Force. It is my privilege to extend a warm welcome to all panelists and participants joining us today. Today's discussion on smarter business is a very apt topic for us as the pandemic has changed the business landscape forever. Before we proceed, it's just a little reminder, as mentioned by Husna just now, if you have any questions at any point during the webinar, please type them into the chat box. I will bring them up during the webinar where suitable or address them during the Q&A session at the end. 
Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our panelists for today. The first panelist is Clarence Leung. He is the CEO of Easy Parcel. Hi, Clarence. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi. Yeah. Clarence graduated from University of Wales, Swansea, in the UK, with a master's degree in material science aerospace in the year 2005. Upon his return to Malaysia, Clarence started daily deals business, something like Lupon and Easy Voucher. During his two-year entrepreneur journey, Clarence understood that e-commerce works hand in hand with career partners spotting another golden opportunity. In June 2014, he started Easy Parcel, a web-based parcel consolidator and e-commerce shipping solutions provider. Within a year, Easy Parcel was awarded the top 20 cradle coach and grow startup company, winner for ASEAN Rice Bowl Award, and recently being selected as top nominees for EY Entrepreneur of the Year. The company served over half a million SME across Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, and Indonesia, with more than 25 million parcels delivered today. Easy Parcel is an online booking platform for parcel delivery, providing the best career service at the best rate. In short, Easy Parcel is the marketplace for career service like Agoda for hotels. Thanks, Clarence. The second panelist for today is Daryl Ang. Hi, Daryl. Hey, hi, hi, everyone. Uh, glad to be here. Hi. Daryl is the executive director of Headbay. Daryl has over 10 years of experience in finance with a diverse background, ranging from being a fintech entrepreneur, investment banker, regulator, and management consultant. His passion for finance started during university, where he graduated from Oxford University with a master's degree in engineering, economics, and management. He is a co-founder of Headbay, a leading supply chain finance platform that helps businesses obtain smarter financing while investors can participate in high quality financing deals. They have the peer-to-peer -peer P2P financing license from the Securities Commission of Malaysia and have partnered with large corporations, banks, and institutional investors to offer their award-winning solution that has funded over 1 billion ringgit. Prior to Catbay, Daryl worked in the investment banking department for Credit Suisse Singapore with the Equity Capital Markets team. During his time there, he raised over 10 billion US dollars through IPOs, placements, rights issues for clients across Southeast Asia. Daryl also had a stint as a regulator with Bank Negara Malaysia in the banking supervision and financial surveillance department. Welcome, Daryl. Last but not least, our third panelist for today is Rico Pang. Hi, Rico. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Hi. Rico is the co-founder and CEO of Sanctum Private Limited. Rico has over 20 years of entrepreneurship experience in emerging markets across properties, supply chain management, e-commerce technology development, family offices, investment in advisory and public listed C-suite corporate management. Rico is the co-founder and CEO of Sanctum Private Limited, which is a leading multi-family office that serves ultra high net worth families, primarily on emerging technology portfolios and digital assets transformation. Sanctum has invested and incubated more than 80 ventures with successful exits, primarily through private equity pre seed round investments. Presently, Rico is the co-founder and global managing partner of Sanctum Global Ventures, the ecosystem fund to incubate unicorns with the emerging technologies that contribute towards the development of global digital economy, smart cities, and social impacts. The funds invest primarily in two deep technology ventures, including robotics, space, biotech, telecommunications, fintech, artificial intelligence. And 
Rico is also the founder and secretary chairman of Deep Tech Forum in collaborations with worldwide stakeholders to drive the deep tech sector to the next level, involving government agencies, private sector, and scientists in the industry to fast track synergies. Welcome again. So um, I'm sure all of you are eager for, to learn from them. I know I am. So without further ado, let's get the ball rolling. The first uh, questions will revolve around identifying opportunities to tackle the unserved market. So um, to kick off this, uh, I will ask Clarence and Daryl uh, some questions pertaining to their company. Easy Parcel and Cat Bay are recent very inspiring local examples on transformation of traditional business model. It was definitely not an easy task to transform a conventional market, and you guys did it. What were the catalysts or motivations you're driving the transformation that you have made to the traditional market? Yeah, maybe uh, Clarence would like to start first. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for the question. Um, from our end, uh, I still clearly remember back in 2014, that's where Easy Parcel started in the very early days. And uh, one of the key reasons when we started the business is more to, we as a consumer, we noticed that the struggling part of it, like when we wanted to send a parcel, we don't even know what is the price of it. We wanted to get the delivery done. It's so troublesome that we need to run across um, all multiple service providers to even just checking the price, finding out where their location. And then uh, it's still not really transparent back then. And um, that, that's also one of the reasons why we started it. And, and we also believe during that time, there are so many small micro SMEs, like people like us, right? Um, facing the same issue, um, having the same challenges um, to even run their business. And because we definitely understand micro sellers um, on all the social channels, we have so many things to look after in just the business particularly by itself. And then um, logistic part, delivery portion should be as seamless as possible. So that is just uh, one portion of it as a consumer perspective. Um, we ourselves as a customers and then by also looking into the other half it's more to the service providers and like a lot of them they have been around for like minimum of like 30 years so how can we actually help them to improve what they have and with what we know as a consumer what we want right so that that's how the the idea actually came about and then um, and and just like what Peter shared just now um, I don't have any background as in what we have been doing now I'm an aerospace engineer it's just getting frustrated as a customer and uh, not really happy with what we already have in the market and then trying to disrupt uh, when we still can. And that's, that's a, the, actually the, the original intention when we first started, as, as simple as that, actually. I see. Thank you. Um, what about you, Daryl? Um, yeah, I think for me, um, so I guess, you know, if you go back to uh, principles of why we started it and all, I think firstly, uh, it's a kind of like an age, age old problem, right? Like the whole um, uh, problem about like getting financing. I think everywhere you're hearing that in you know, Malaysia, you've got like 80 billion in terms of like unmet financing demands. Uh, across Asia, you know, anywhere from 80 to 100 billion um, in terms of US dollars across Asia. So that actually served as a basis, right? To, actually think about you know what we can do to actually improve this further so i think you know having that problem then you know we go about thinking about uh what the traditional guys are currently doing and then you realize that uh just prior to this i was actually in uh, uh bank Nagara. so there i actually supervise uh, a lot of uh banks and actually understand you know behind the scenes how they're kind of running and then that kind of like even doing back then things um you'd be quite surprised how manual the processes are um, and I think even till now, I think, yes, there's a shift towards it, but um, a lot of the processes, you know, you have like uh, two, three floors of like stuff just working on very manual processes, form filling, you know, data entry and stuff like that. And I think, you know, all this, you'd be surprised, like uh, you would have thought like, someone would have come up uh, and solved that problem. Um, and, and actually, that's exactly why uh, we see a lot of impacts that have come into the play where, um, you know, all these things like in terms of digitalization, data and all, um, it, it's definitely part and parcel of like, you know, moving towards, you know, just traditional, you know, brick and mortar banking towards, uh, you know, digital and also uh, expanding the product offering. So I think for me, you know, in terms of like motivations, you know, I think that really got me going on. Like, that's definitely a big problem that needs to be solved. 
Um, and then, you know, we, when we thought about it, like, uh, in terms of co-founders, we all had, uh, I guess, contrary to Clarence's background, uh, all of us, the co-founders actually had, like, finance background. Uh, for me, I've always been in finance. That, that's my passion. Lah. So, uh, without a doubt, like, I thought, you know, when I was in Singapore, doing investment banking, like, what's next, right? And then, you know, I definitely thought, you know, I wanted to move back to Malaysia because uh, Malaysia is definitely a good place to start for entrepreneurs. Um, and I thought, you know, uh, instead of like, I don't know, <laughs> doing something completely unrelated to finance, I think uh, best for me to go down that finance route. Lah. And uh, that's where um, uh, Kevin came into the picture. Lah. And uh, I would have to say that I haven't really looked back since I've been quite an exciting journey. Uh, having, you know, gone through quite a, a different, um, you know, from being a regulator, from being in a large corporation, and all that now, um, start up and, and trying to grow into a uh, bigger um, and a uh, big company that serves, you know, thousands and thousands of customers. Uh. I see. Okay. Thank you. Uh, what are the main obstacles uh, for setting up the business when no one else is doing? Maybe to you, Clarence? Uh, definitely a lot and a lot and a lot. <laughs> because and, and even in the early days, no one actually understand what we actually do, right? Like a lot of big players out there, the, the first question they ask, hey, uh, why we need you guys, right? Who doesn't know who we are? <laughs> and uh, definitely, if you want to send something, definitely you know who to choose. Why we need someone to represent us to actually uh, uh, market their service. That is, that is the first question. And then the second question they normally used to ask, who are you, right? <laughs> if you are an en engineer, what are you doing here in this industry? We have been, been around for 30, 40 years. And then why are you telling us what to do? So definitely a lot of uh, uh, typical challenges that is uh, from a startup perspective. Uh, we don't really have any background right to even justify what we have been doing is the right direction during that time and uh, even the early days um i think back then um, e-commerce is still not really blooming yet it's just a uh, very early early days uh, when we see the the challenges so we really need to go through a lot of uh, pitching not really just for funding but pitching for customers pitching for partners uh, getting all these partners to buy in um and then end of the day uh, we managed to get uh, all the smaller ones to, to come in to join us um, because to them, there's nothing to lose, right? And then uh, ended up, the bigger boys start coming in. Hey, since all my, my, my competitors in the market is already on board, can we also join in? So it's quite funny as in the entire journey to even to recruit uh, partners to join us. And uh, that, that's a, just one small bit of it. And of course, there are still many more, even though until today, um, how can we actually push through technology to... Uh, partners that we have been working on because uh, they still have their own uh, legacy issue challenges and how can we actually help them to actually improve what they already have with what uh, they can do. I think that is still a big portion of it if I look at like uh, Malaysia or even Southeast Asia um, logistic delivery solution, right? Uh, comparing to all the big, big uh, countries, uh, advanced countries like Japan, China, we are still very far off. Um, that, that also created a lot of opportunity for everyone actually. Great, great. Uh, what are the main obstacles for you there? Um, that's an interesting question. I think for me, well, firstly, I think I want to echo quite a bit of what uh, Clarence has mentioned. I think, you know, in terms of like that whole trust factor, right? I mean, like as a startup, um, when you first start, like uh, who who are you? Like you keep asking all these questions, like, you know, even some things like you'll get like, oh, you know, will you still be around? Uh, can I even trust because we're in the finance industry, you know, can I even trust you with my money? Can I trust this and that? So that that is always that, that, that factor, right? When you first start out, like, you know, can can someone actually trust you to be a client and also service uh, for a long, long time? Because, you know, they don't want to change uh, vendors every one, two years. I mean, um, sadly, unfortunately, that is part and parcel of like startup where uh, there are uh, cases where, you know, it doesn't survive. So I think uh, along the way, that whole trust factor uh, needs to be built. Like, I think uh, we've done uh, it. We've kind of overcome it through, I guess, through having a regulated, uh, being a regulated entity. So we are regulated by Securities Commission that at least gives um, some comfort to our clients. Uh, um, so that that's you know whole part on, on the trust. I think secondly, in terms of obstacles, I would have to say, um, have, making that step right. Like I mean, you know, when you want to introduce new products, when you want to introduce a new service, how do you know whether uh, that's actually going to be well accepted by the market, right? I mean, I think I don't know. Maybe for clients, I recall, I, I, I sometimes can't sleep at night. Like, I keep thinking, like, you know, is this the right product for the market? Like, will it be acceptable? Like, because the thing is that 
you have to spend many, many weeks, if not months, uh, to actually develop that product. And then, you know, if you develop it, if you spend that, all that time, you know, even from the tech side, from the structuring, the product guys, uh, there's a lot of effort put into it. So there's actually like, you know, KPEX um, in the sense that like it's from a time and, and, and employee, you know, man hours spent. Um, so that's to me like the main obstacle. Uh, like it, it's very hard to to kind of like get that right. Uh, so um, so how I kind of um, I guess overcome it also to always have like an anchor in mind uh, uh, when you come up with a product. Uh, firstly, obviously you need to know that there's a, a market for it, and um, and if you really believe in your product, uh, it would sell. Um, I think you know if you develop develop a good product uh, and there's a market for it, I think without a doubt like you should be able to, to sell it. Uh, but then again, there's always the whole like um, numbers game, right? I mean, as a startup, uh, unfortunately, that, that's part of puzzle. You have to keep knocking at doors. You know, you, you, it's a numbers game. You have to knock 100 doors, you probably only get open to five. And out of the five, you only get um, only one or two actually accept your product. Right? So unfortunately, that, that that's the whole, uh, you know, it's uh, the whole grind that you have to kind of go through. Thanks, Daryl. Um, a question to Rico. Uh. Uh, the Bitcoin rally and crash in a year. Can you share with us how you have ventured into the business, your opinion on the outlook of cryptocurrencies and what are the values that the decentralized currencies are serving to the communities? Over to you, Rico. Thank you. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned uh, it crashed in a year, but um, last week onwards, it went back up um, pretty much uh, to a very um, comfortable level uh, say around thirty eight to forty thousand US dollar per Bitcoin. Um, the highest we saw this year was around sixteen thousand US dollar. So I think I, you're referring to that crash. But I, in fact, a year ago, Bitcoin price was ranging around nine thousand to eleven thirteen thousand US dollar per Bitcoin. I think, so, depending how you're looking at the crash, uh, <laughs> as usual, cryptocurrencies uh, being a very volatile market um, due to the nature. As uh, what Daryl and Clarence mentioned earlier, a lot of things are very disruptive. Um, the technology can just come out and you just disrupt certain industries uh, from any parts of the world. And, and all of us are having a problem with collecting and understanding the market um, in different market. If you launch a product that is not suitable, it's all about timing. Whether can the market receive it and accept it and, and react to it the way you expect it to be uh, is a challenge. So what the crypto projects that we have in the space are all mostly experiment. They have a community, they build a community that has interest in them. They communicate with them, they organize a lot of Ask Me Anything uh, session, we call it AMA sessions, and they get feedback. And most of the projects that normally come up with a white paper to see what is the response for the market. Does people like the idea? Then the next stage will be to do a proof of concept, develop an MVP. That will take probably six months to one year, depending how complicated is the tech. Um, then they will live it with a test net, and then people test on it and fix all the bugs, and then they go live eventually. So this whole process of developing a new product is very common in the crypto um, sort of space in terms of what we call our initial um, digital offering lately in the last one year. Um, it, it was very fast moving, very fast paced. A community could be built in two months. A tech could be launched in six months to one year time. So this whole cycle is disrupting the whole current tech space as we speak, but mostly likely into the FinTech sort of market. Uh, one of my project that we invested uh, in March this year, we raised around 9 million US dollar within three days. Wow. And then we need to find a solution. And in the end, we raised around 14 million plus ish by issuing more tokens and changing some tokenomics to fit the market demand. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually a digital banking solutions uh, app that is actually enabling the use of crypto and also normal fiat. Um, and it's also a non-custodial wallet, which means that today, if you create a wallet address, only you know about this no one else knows about it. So whether you activate it or you use it, it's up to you. At the same time, you can also do a KYC, uh, AML with any banking solutions that you have in your country and integrate it with your crypto wallet. So that become a, 
uh, official KYC wallet that is being monitored by the authorities in your country. So you have both of the, the wallet that you have a decentralized wallet, non-custodial wallet, as well as a centralized wallet where it's being monitored. So this is where we see the need of people having this choice and the right to know, hey, I want to put some funds here or put some funds there. It's a choice matter for every individual. So I think that's where we see the market shift. People like this sort of things. I can transfer globally. I can transfer USDT or Bitcoin or Ethereum the other side of the world within a few minutes. Or sometimes if the network is super slow, maybe 20 minutes or half an hour, the transaction is completed. And the transaction fees are still acceptable, except for Ethereum. I hate to say that, but sometimes when the Ethereum um, blockchain is congested, such as two days ago, um, Vitalik, the founder of Ethereum and the action um, of a few celebrity actors launched a, a NFT platform, non-fungible token called the Stoner Cats. Oh. In the first hour of launching, it was 1 p.m. Uh, 1 a.m. in Dubai time. The transaction fee for buying one NFT was 310 US dollar transaction wow. fee. But the NFT could cost only like 500 US dollar to, to buy the NFTs of a Stoner Cat image and character. So that doesn't make sense to me. That shows that there are a lot of opportunities to improve in the technology side of things. There might, there might be a lot of solutions and innovations coming out in the next couple of years that would you know, reduce this sort of problem. And a lot of other blockchain has already solved this problem. However, mm. there's not enough publicity. For example, Binance Smart Chain is fast, it's cheap, but not many people are using it yet as compared to, you know, the Ethereum blockchain. So all these things need time of adoption. Um, and I, I foresee that uh, the Bitcoin price will continue to rise uh, to around 30,000 price range. Um, and then there'll be might be some dip again that might go down a little bit. And by, by the end of the year, this year in 2021, the all time high price for Bitcoin should range around 100,000 to 120,000 rich, right? So that, that is my personal advice. It's not financial advice. That's what we see in the trend of how the adoption of Bitcoin as a store of value has being used globally, not only by individual, but also by public as a company that are actually putting in the public research company with the funds mm. in Bitcoin. So they rather hash their you know, funds in Bitcoin rather than keeping it as it is as a US dollar and putting it as an FD or something. So that has changed how corporates are looking at the value as a, of Bitcoin as a store of value uh, to hash on it rather than hedging on their own currency such as US dollar. So that means a lot of people are buying Bitcoin and the demand for Bitcoin has increased. When you have a scarcity of 21 million Bitcoins globally, mm. um, and if the demand goes higher, the price goes higher, that's a very easy to understand philosophy and, and theory. So that's what we have witnessed with the Bitcoin price. And for most of us who are all Bitcoin maximalists, we believe that the Bitcoin price will go up to 1 million US dollar per Bitcoin wow. in just a matter of time. And um, we are foreseeing that to be happening in the next three years time. So this is a good time to buy Bitcoin. Huh? <laughs> if you're buying to keep, uh, I would say yes, definitely. Um, if you keep it for long term. Um, for traders, there are many other options, um, you know, um, so it, it's really up to individual. Okay. Thank you, Rico. This is the question for all the three panelists. How do you find yourself adding value to the ecosystem? Maybe Clarence would like to start first. Um, I think at the end of the day, is also need to find the balance between the win-win or portion between parties. So from the consumer end, what are the values we are actually creating uh, for people that wanted to send a parcel apart from just comparing pricing on, online? So definitely we need to understand uh, what are the needs and then what are the challenges they face. So if you are sending one parcel, definitely you can still hand return the airway bill, right? So when we are talking about e-commerce, one day you probably have like 50, 100 or 500 parcels. So how are you going to write all the hand return airway bill traditionally? Like I'm talking about like three to four years ago, right? And are you going to hire students to actually sit there and do all the processing? 
all the interns are, are always that has been offered that job right previously so, <laughs> so so that's one portion of it then they come back to um, uh, our partners how can we actually help them in uh, in saving the cost as in uh, using technology like example the customer support service most of the time when we call no one actually answered right so it's, a, it's all due to um, lack of manpower higher yeah. volume um, and that also causes um, the transparency of like where do they really know where is the parcel currently right? if, if they can't really tell how can the support team actually support this particular role in telling the customers on that end so there are so many areas that uh, can be improved and uh, that that's the reason why we see the the value of, of what we have been creating from all the parties yep. hopefully that answered the question yeah thank you thank you Karen. what about you daryl um, I, I think, you know, in terms of our value add, so we've got to break it down to the different segments that we're in. So I think um, generally we probably have like uh, three, three main customers. Uh, one being uh, SME, who is ultimately the borrower. Uh, and then we also have uh, banks and institutional investors and also funders who actually use our, our systems to actually process some of this. And also we have the investors, uh, uh, you know, retail investors that actually invest into our B2B platform. So when, when we talk about each of these, I think you know one thing that probably is common across all is that we always look at um, three things are like you gotta do it like faster, cheaper, or or much easier. I think you know, digital and all. So I think that that that's the main value that we add. So I think you know specifically if we want to go uh, into some of the details of it, I think you know we always try to 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 look at it and, and think about how can we do this uh, in a smarter way. Um, so a lot of the times, like we think about the whole process and how we can give a smarter financing. So, for example, you know, to to borrowers, um, we want to see like uh, what, how can we actually give them um, financing that is on a sustainable basis and also cheap. So actually, relatively in terms of our market rates, uh, okay, maybe the banks not <laughs> we can't beat the banks, but like in terms of all the other alternative finances, um, that, that's something that we try and offer in terms of the cheapest rate lah. Um, so, so um, that's you know for the, some of the values that we add. So there's always you know more more demand for for, for credit. Um, so it's always going back to those three things like you know whether you can do it faster. So banks typically you know get back. You apply on a normal basis. You probably get one to two months uh, if you're lucky. Um, and then for us, we try and do it you know within a week. And then your know, subsequent drawdown can be uh, within T plus one, T plus two. Um, and then, you know, everything is kind of digital that, that solves like, the easier. And then obviously, you know, it boils down to the rates. Lah. So we definitely uh, see ourselves offering at a much more competitive rate. Lah. Um, and then, you know, for the investor side, I think for us, we try and also inculcate um, like high quality uh, notes. Lah. So because ultimately we are kind of a platform that kind of uh, issues out or, or facilitates the issuing of notes. So um, we try and keep ourselves you know, uh, you know, if I was an investor, which actually kept me, we are an investor ourselves in some of the notes. Uh, we want to ensure that you know this is actually a sustainable um, investing, where you know there's not high default rates, but still uh, given uh, giving a decent rate. So our net returns, uh, post fees, including like investor fees and all, is, is around uh, eight point five percent on average, and we typically aim up to ten percent because I, I think above ten percent sometimes you know for a fixed income type instrument may be a bit. Too high, like, I think you know, to be like skim chipper kind, and also I think we, we focus. We, we have uh, we are very focused in terms of what we want to do in terms of our target market, our um, niche and, and segments. Uh. Thank you, Daryl. Next, uh, Rico, do you have any um, things to share with us on the value adding adding value to the ecosystem? I think uh, we position ourselves as um, incubator. Um, slash investors uh, in the ecosystem that we are in, uh, particularly in the deep tech and also in the blockchain, crypto, two separate market that we are viewing because uh, the deep tech sector is like what Daryl and Clarence are looking at. If it's very conventional, it's very conservative, everything is set in stones and a lot of procedures are regulated. So yeah. the process takes a long time. One race for the conservative market, but Daryl is doing probably takes three to six months. And then on, on the other end, with the blockchain crypto side, everything is like crazily fast. We fundraise in two weeks, three weeks, we close the fund, uh, everything done in a smart contract, automated. The, the tokens is being sent out to the investors over a period of two years, automatically with a smart contract, automated. So I 
we are stuck in between this whole ecosystem where we are seeing the spectrum. Ultimately, why we call our company Sanctum is because the vision that we have is create a holy place for people, to empower people, to empower businesses, and to actually bring more soil rights to the people itself because you're in control of your wealth. And you shouldn't be controlled by a government or a politician change of regulators and suddenly you declare everything and open up all your books. So that is what we're involving in terms of transparency and create a system of trust between people using technology. So we review blockchain as a trust as a service solution. Uh, and people build solutions on blockchain based on that technology because it's cryptography. Um, algorithms encryption that make things transparent and you can't really hack it or change it or alter it on the ledger system. So that's what we are looking at um, as the basic foundation of our company and what we are bringing to ecosystem. We are constantly looking for good deep tech companies, good talents, because that's what we need to build good companies and, and, and making sure that the business is sustainable. So I think that's what we are continuously working on exploring and constantly looking for um, for partners that are aligned with this vision. The next thing that we were looking at is at, after making all this money, where do you put the money to? As we are looking at the vision of Sanctum where we were going back to the society as impact projects. So all the projects that we are doing has impact purposes. Most of the projects that we advise should have a foundation or NGO arm that does CSR to give back to the society in the interest of their whole ecosystem. So for example, if on my project, they were doing artisan gold mining in Africa. And we know in the gold mining operation is very complicated. And one of the problems that they solved was to remove mercury in the whole process of gold mining. Why removing mercury? Because mercury is poisonous. A lot of kids or, or, or people who are mining absorb mercury burning through the process and they were poisonous to the body. The mercury is being put into the river along the process of mining that pollute the river and cause a lot of health issues to the people living in the whole ecosystem. By removing mercury, you know, that will create a green gold. And that green gold is sold at a higher price than normal gold in the market. So forth and so forth. So these are such examples that why we are doing a microfinancing using micro defi in the gold mining operations using you know smart contracts and blockchain solutions as a fintech product to change how traditional mining operations operate across the whole supply chain so this is just an example of one of the projects that we are involved in and how it acts as a change agent to make life better for people in certain countries yeah, thank you for all the panelists. I think the first segment on the motivation and obstacles, um, we have gotten a lot of uh, great insights from you guys. From the motivation, I would like to sum up is filling the gap in the market, fulfill the needs of the user, and solving problem in the market. Whereas for obstacles, um, we have learned today that we need buy-in from the partners, believe in your own product, and also we have to have a win-win solution with all the stakeholders. Yeah, so perhaps uh, we can move on to the second segment. The second segment is on the urgency of digitalization and up to what level is the current technology capable of the urgency of digitalization in terms from for the smaller um, audit firm. It is quite prevalent because of the lockdown. Uh, most of the firms uh, need to work from home and using technology, you can actually speed up the process. So, um, for all the panelists, uh, what's your view of the COVID-19 in relation to your business, economics, and global, and what's the impact of the disruptions, and are there any opportunities uh, during this uh, pandemic? Um, maybe uh, Daryl would like to start first. Sure, sure. <clears throat> so um, I think without a doubt, like, uh, uh, this, with the whole COVID situation, I think that definitely accelerated everyone's um, agenda in terms of digitalization, you know, from uh, large organizations uh, all the way down to the mom and pop store, right? So I think, you know, from large organizations, to be honest, like prior to the whole COVID situation, 
uh, we've been pitching <laughs> like probably non-stop like few 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 uh, times uh, every month fall up but like you know it's a nice idea but okay maybe we're not ready for it yet but then with the whole COVID situation everyone's uh, you know working from home everything has to be moved to the digital perspective um, a lot more companies are, are more interested uh, to actually digitalize the whole process so you know from being from, from uh, you know could be anything from financing platform and so on um, and, and it goes down all the way down, right? It trickles all the way down to, you know, the mom and pop stores, SMEs. Um, in, in fact, so much so that even the government are, is actually giving a lot of grants uh, to MDEC and so on to actually digitalize the whole business, right? I think um, without a doubt, and, and, you know, whenever government gives in grants, it's like a public good, right? Like they, they're doing it for a reason because they acknowledge the whole benefits of the whole digitalization. Lah. So I, I think <laughs> kind of covered a little bit in terms of, uh, uh, you know, whether there's an urgency for it. Um, in terms of you know how it impacts our business, um, so as I mentioned, uh, you know in terms of like the software as a service, software solution provider, uh, we've seen that uh, we've definitely seen a spike in terms of our financing requests as well. I think the whole unfortunately though, the, when when there's a crisis, um, there's always what we call like a cash um, strap position where everyone holds on to the cash. Um, I mean, obviously there there is also an increase in terms of um, generating business, but. It's also a point where you know a lot of the B2B trades, uh, a lot of them are just holding on to the cash, right? Because cash is king, you need cash to survive, you need cash to pay your staff, supplies, and so on. Uh, well, actually, lesser is suppliers because they're holding on to your cash. So that, that whole problem actually, um, because everyone is starting to be a lot more conservative and all, um, and holding on to cash, that actually gives rise to a lot of like financing requests, right? Like because um, they still need cash to actually operate, unfortunately. You know, even though the the uh, your business revenue has decreased, um, you still need cash. So we definitely see an increase in terms of uh, financing press. But having said that, um, with the whole crisis situation, uh, there's definitely a lot more credit risks involved, uh, and that's why we've kind of um, you know cut down and scrutinized more heavily in terms of our credit underwriting. I think it is not just a case where you know we're seeing it. Uh, in Malaysia, I think across the board, um, global banks and all, you know, likes of Hugh Morgan, uh, Citibank and all, they, they've increased their um, credit reserves ratios like at least 10, 12 times because in, in anticipation of like further defaults. Um, so all these, you know, uh, we've definitely come into effect uh, in terms of like planning and running your business because um, you have to monitor all these risks properly um, and ensure that, you know, although we are dispersing a lot of money, uh, we still want to maintain uh, that low default risk situation, and, and you know, Touchwood so far, Cambi has uh, maintained like uh, near zero, uh, and for our P2P, we've actually maintained zero percent default rate. Um, so yeah, I, I think that that's uh, some of our perspectives from Cambi. Thank you, thank you, thank you Daru. Uh, over to you, Rico. Um, I think over the pandemic, the most hmm. significant changes is actually towards decentralization. Um, people are not working in the same office anymore. People are, people are working from their home, from where they are, they may be going on holiday in Phuket and they stay there for two months and they got stuck there and they were working as well. So um, that is more significant um, over the last one and a half years since the pandemic started. Uh, we observed that. Secondly, the adoption of digitization of app technologies. A lot of things can be done on the app while people are stuck at home during a lockdown they still need to get things done. They still need to shop for things. They still make payment. Everything is done on, you know, an app or more probably a, a desktop. So that adoption, I think, in uh, Southeast Asia has been speed up in terms of the adoption of technologies uh, by force. Actually, everywhere you go, you need to take out a phone and scan a QR code. Now, if you go out in certain countries, um, most of the PCR tests you have a QR code to make sure that this is a real one. It's not a fake one and those of security measures has improved and, in, um, and also increasingly being used by many companies, government agencies, and so on and so forth. So that, that adoption has speed up. But compared to a country like China, nothing has changed. They've been there all the while. Yeah. But certain countries who are more conservative, such as European countries, they don't like to use QR code to make payment. They still prefer NFC touch sort of thing where they are so used to it the, apps, the, the QR code campaign failed miserably in those countries. And now they see suddenly, oh, I'm forced to use it. They can use it. And, and they have to use it because it's, it's required by the regulators. So see, things have changed. 
um, for for us in the whole um, investment and also in the crypto space, um, it has been a wonderful year for us. Um, the adoption of crypto has gone up significantly. People are not doing anything at home. They start trading. Uh, more trading volume came in, more liquidity came in. I think that's good for the space. Um, initially, we thought like investment will be hotter because, oh, we normally meet face-to-face -to, -face to close the deal. We close the investment, right? The, the trust and talking to each other has to be face to face. Over the time of lockdown, or I think post August last year, everything is done through a Zoom call, contract is being signed digitally, funds are being transferred. I mean, most investors or ultra high level individuals just, just got fed up by being locked down. They didn't know when they can get back to the normal norm where we can still meet up and talk about business. So that changed a lot in our investment um, space where things can be done digitally. We invest in different projects and companies and funds of funds globally as a GP and LP, whatever it is. Globally, contracts are being signed. Funds are being wired through, whether it's a, through the normal fiat money or if it's through crypto, things are still moving on. Like, it has changed. Prior, prior to that, before COVID, we were still meeting up in conferences, meeting up with meetings, going to each other's offices to meet up. Um, so one of the things that was funny, because in 2019, in June, we were traveling so much, almost on a monthly basis globally, mm -hmm. decided to just close down our own office in Singapore. And wow. we saved a lot of impacts on, on the operation of the office, but the business didn't got affected at all. We were still, my BD guys are still out there meeting people, flying around to close the deals. And, and things are still moving on as usual. So it was like, this is before COVID, six months before it, and it was more of a business decision. And we saw that no one actually come to office nowadays. We're meeting out, out, out there in some hotel lobby or lounge or cafe somewhere. And we are not going to office. And the BD guys are not in the office. They are always out there. So why investing so much and getting such a big office space for show? Sure, doesn't serve a purpose. So we shut it off. And when COVID hit and then we start employing more people globally, we start sending off employment contract digitally and people sign up. I've never met the person in, in person at all done the interview on Zoom for three times, hired and worked for me for the last one year. So hiring has changed as well. Investment has changed. Um, the way business are being done has also changed. I think that's the most um, obvious impact that we saw in the last one and a half years uh, since COVID started. Okay. So technically now you don't um, go to office. I think before, even COVID-19 happens, you don't go. I presume now you totally don't uh, go to office anymore, right? <laughs> we don't normally go to office, but we do still go out for meetings and meet up. I agree. Everywhere okay. around the world, we, we, we travel a lot for different, we were invited for speakers for certain conferences. We were invited to networking events, we were mm. meetings and business matching or whatsoever by the conference organizers. And we were traveling constantly on a monthly basis. And we were rarely in office, say like only five days a month, right? <laughs> but deals are still going on. Um, contract are being signed, funds are being transferred. We are still investing. They are still investing in some of our projects. So, so things are still moving forward. Mm -hmm. we don't, I think that that itself was happening to us before COVID in our space. And post COVID, like, I mean, look, we are on Zoom call today virtually. Yeah. We are still communicating, we are still sharing, we are still brainstorming whatsoever. So that itself is made possible, such as technology like Zoom. And Zoom, because of this, grows so much in revenue <laughs> over the pandemic. It was just yep. pure timing. Yep. But who, who used Zoom before pandemic, really? Seriously? You know? So things like this is opportunistic for many companies who actually grab the opportunity during this sort of you know, chaotic time, and they grew significantly. I still remember last year, the share price of Zoom moved in tandem with the numbers of infection. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Rico. Yeah. Thank you, Rico. Uh, over to you, Clarence. Thank you. Uh, I think from our end, it's kind of like a bittersweet scenario. Um, definitely new norm, everyone buying online, right? It, it actually created <laughs> a new norm for everyone. Buying online is just one click away. Comparing yeah. to before, we still wanted to go out and touch and see and smell and feel. <laughs> rather now everyone speaks uh, staying at home is the key priority right um, yeah. 
So that actually uh, inherited further on the logistic portion where deliveries is one of the essential services that we are in. And of course, when we said so, uh, our team has to be on the ground over the past like one and a half years by looking at the numbers has been increasing, they are still have to do get things done. So that, that's the reason why I said it's, it's kind of a bittersweet in both ends. And then of course, then uh, like what we co-mentioned just now, a lot of things have changed, like how we operate. We haven't been gone back to the office for the past, like um, I think 17 months. We started to call ourselves uh, to work from home even before the country started to declare the first MCO. Um, that also uh, accelerate further as in like, Previously, we don't even uh, have the option to work from home, like especially for a tech team, for people that is actually working in the middle of the night. So instantly, all this option is available. And uh, even until now, you, if you ask us, do we really want to go back to the office? The answer is potentially yes for social, for casual, not really for work. So the, the entire ecosystem has changed. The entire behavior has also changed. Going back to the office is no longer just for work, but it's just to see a colleague that you've never met before over the past one year. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so that then also uh, another uh, plus point. And then of course, uh, when we are actually in the logistics scene, uh, a lot of things that we have actually launched over the past uh, one and a half years, a lot of initiative uh, that actually has been done, um, even uh, to encourage people to go on digital, to start looking into it, at least to start feeling about it. Because um, even before the pandemic, uh, a lot of uh, local um, companies, um, retail shops, they are actually being uh, flooded with uh, all the walking customers. Um, mm -hmm. They don't really have luxurious time to actually look at online digital. They don't yeah. even have the team to actually do that. But when pandemic actually hits, that actually gives them uh, some time to actually step back and look, look after what can they do uh, apart from just uh, serving their normal uh, daily customers, right? So we, we actually run more than a few thousand uh, store, uh, online uh, classes to actually share the experience because uh, so far we have been serving more than a million customers across the region. So definitely we know uh, what has been done uh, across the region, uh, what all these small micro SMEs has been through. So we have been sharing all this information on top. And um, just most recently, about like three weeks ago, we launched another campaign. Um, it's a food bank digital, foodbank.digital. Uh, within three weeks, we actually received more than 60,000 applicants Wow. And uh, we managed to, to actually fulfill uh, more than 10,000 uh, deliveries of food boxes uh, within a few weeks' time. So uh, all this has never been planned that uh, what we can do apart from just a logistic providers. But when uh, all the startup ecosystem actually work together, a lot of uh, miracle things can actually happen. And all this has never been our pipeline that uh, we can actually do that on top of our daily work. So I think that is also the beauty of it as in... Uh, um, the contribution from the team, the belief from the team as in uh, the early days uh, back when you asked the question, right? How challenging it is um, yeah. by actually introducing something really new. Even getting a team to come on board to join us is also challenging because they never heard about this, right? So mm -hmm. it all goes back to like seven years uh, uh, period, um, getting the right team because at the time, sometimes it's actually very hard to actually define right or wrong. It's just more to who are the ones that actually believe in what you do from the customer's perspective, from the team itself, and then from your partners out there, right? Then to define uh, who you are today. So yeah, pandemic really uh, accelerate a lot of things, um, both internal and external. At least it create more values for the team to actually see we are not just a service providers of getting parcel delivered from A to B. Yep, thank you, Perrin. Uh, the next question will be how important and to what extent has digitalization helped your business in getting to where it is now? And do you think the digitalization trend is overhyped? Uh, Rico, would you like to take this question first? Okay, sure. And uh, I'd like to answer some questions that uh, Husna and Lisa posted yeah. in the chat yeah. as well. Uh, I think Husna asked a question whether if um, the deals were made during the COVID last year and this year, are they not so badly hit areas? I would say the answer is no. Some of these guys, the founders, the chairman or CEO has got COVID positive along the way. Along of us having Zoom call and say, oh, this is my fifth day or this is my 10th day. I'm like feeling shit and la la. So no, this is happening globally with a lot of business owner who are into the tech side um, where things can be done from home and still business can go on. Uh, they're developing new, new technologies, new business 
um, and, and some of the more existing business that have been running that are doing a transformation that needed funds to, to, to carry over to the transition. So these are things that are still happening and it's around the world, whether it's in Switzerland, whether it's in Germany, whether it's in New York, it's, it's around the world sort of seeing where deals are happening eventually. Uh, I think August was the worst. August, September is an interesting period of time where it's two months before the year-end holiday. <laughs> they were thinking it's holidays if possible. My fund needs to be deployed before the Q4 <laughs> um, and budget for next year has to be out. <laughs> and so for this period of Q3 is interesting where they need to make decisions. They can't just sit there and wait. I think that that really changed a lot of things and people realize that, look, this is no longer short term. This is probably a three years to a seven years recovery of global economy since the, the you know, pandemic started. It was a, a global economy yeah. now. That effect will be for long term. So I think that wake up call is there. Um, in terms of um, Lisa mentioning about uh, digital transformation and in terms of how important the data is, yes, last year we saw a lot of hacks. A lot of hackers were actually hacking companies and stuff because people were working from home. The, the security level just dropped. Uh, a lot of things can be hacked through the router from home. A lot of hack happened. Yes, the, the whole economy was actually on the cyber security side was a huge um, turnaround for tech guys. And, and they were building a lot of solutions around that to ensure that even security at home, not in office space, is, is there to secure the data and logins and passwords and all this protection. At the same time, on <clears throat> the um, crypto side of things, um, suddenly we realized that there was a hype about non fungible tokens what was non-fungible tokens being used for was actually to digitize and to protect the IP in you know, using a smart contract such as non-fungible token to securitize it for the inventor or the owner of the IP. Say for instance, if I'm a songwriter, I created a song, or I'm a DJ, I created a song that is very good. I no longer need to go through another publisher or another distributors of my music to distribute them and I get peanuts because they are the ones who make the most of the money. I can actually sell my music online to all this um, NFT marketplace to people and they can buy it directly for me. I can create 2,000 copies, 1 million copies of this thing and you can use it. You know, So I can sell it digitally using a smart contract called the non-fungible token built on the Ethereum blockchain. So this suddenly became a hype. Um, it was someone who actually bought a piece of art, fine art, huge piece of fine art physically and the digital version. Um, and the digital version of the fine art can be animated as well. So the content were actually changing how we look at fine art. That piece of art was sold for 63 million US dollars. So it became a huge hype in the marketplace where hope oh, suddenly there's this thing, this technology where in the crypto sphere you can actually cryptograph um, and encrypt certain data and IP using technology and you can protect it and you can transfer it from a wallet to wallet sort of concept where I can transfer from this digital wallet to that wallet if I sell this you know, asset across digitally. So the transfer of asset uh, is disrupted in a way. Um, imagine in the future, if you have a land title that you own for this building and it's a digital certificate. And once you sell this land title, that digital certificate can be transferred from this um, wallet to that wallet with, with a new owner with a procedure in place where there's custodian so on and so forth in the whole trade um, procedures so that 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 is something that can be done in the near future with the change of how smart contracts are actually automating um instead of removing the lawyer's job because the smart contracts still need to be read by lawyers basically and set down the terms um and and taxation auditing everything still needs to be done on that asset. So I wouldn't say we will ring any job at all, but it will be making things much more efficient and easier to use and user friendly and convenient for people. I think the key is convenient when digital assets are being used um, to digitize physical objects. So I think that transformation is happening gradually in our space. Um, I'm, I just invested in another company that actually launched a tech where it's encrypting and decentralizing the file storage on operating systems to make sure that all the digital assets has a full life cycle of management and protection. 
if you create an IP today digitally, you are the owner. You can lease it out. You can let people brand it and use it. If it's a music, you can say pay $1 per month and they can use it, right? And you pay directly to me. And if I decided one day, or I decided to just delete this asset, I have the right to do it if I'm the owner of this asset. So this whole full life cycle of uh, digital intellectual properties can be managed using a technology that is being built along the way. It will be launched in the next six months to nine months time in the market. Yeah, thank you, Rico. Parents, what's your view on this? Mm, I think from my end, it's more to, uh, it actually work both both ways, um, digitalization and also like uh, digi digitization is also uh, two ends of it. Like uh, for example, the first one, um, how, how you actually convert going into digital in the first place, right? When you don't really, you, a lot of your process flow is actually uh, very manual. Like uh, if you talk about the traditional way of uh, sending a parcel, not just about costing perspective, um, how are you going to get the best deal in town? And then how many manpower you really need to actually process a certain volume of parcel. So that instantly you, you, you can actually convert it into uh, using what is already available in the market instead of uh, building it by yourself. So that, that's the first part of it. Second part of it, uh, a lot of people are already um, trying to automate the process flow. But during this process, again, are they trying to build it by themselves or are they getting something is ready-made the, from the shelf? So th this is what we can see and uh, what we have been uh, actually specialized in doing, uh, helping all these uh, um, service providers and also uh, e-commerce, micro e-commerce uh, sellers who is on like Facebook, Instagram, WeChat, um, to improve their process flow on top of getting the savings directly. So that, that's what we have been doing. Thank you. Uh, what about you, Daryl? Um, so I think uh, for us, I think you know, we, we love the right? I mean, because we're financial, um, uh, we, we analyze a lot of data. So, so in terms of digitization in itself, um, even the small aspects, um, you know, in terms of like uh, when the payment is made, uh, by who, by when, uh, which branch and all, I think a lot of these indicators can actually be used and fed into credit models that we have. So definitely, you know, the whole digitization in itself does, um, does help because um, now with a lot more data, uh, you can do a lot more analysis to it. But having said that, <laughs> there's always that balance, right? I mean, you don't want to to just analyze data just for the sake of it. I mean, sometimes you know, some people say, oh, you know, I have this very good data set and all, uh, but then when you really try to do it, then, you know, maybe it probably only helps uh, improve your credit model for like five, 10%, because a lot of times you really need to also understand it. I mean, um, the, the thing about data as well is that you really need to understand and actually uh, utilize it. Uh, otherwise, sometimes like it just becomes too, too, um, too much noise. Uh, then it just defeats uh, the whole um, uh, purpose because ultimately, you know, data is used to achieve a certain objective, uh, not the other way around. We don't use data and like, oh, think like, oh, you know, what, what, what can I do with it? I think, you know, you have to understand first what you want to achieve and then you look at the data to see whether the data can actually solve that, that, that you know, objective or solution that you want to, to look at. Um, so, yes, uh, this whole, you know, digitization, uh, uh, this has helped. The business and i think you know it's not overhyped <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay thank you thank you for all the panelists uh, point of view so in terms of digitalization we can summarize that uh, big and small companies adopting technology and COVID 19 have actually accelerated the technology adaption while adapting this technology we have to do our own uh, risk assessment and also how do we add values from this digitalization to our business. Yeah. So uh, moving on to the third segment, the third segment, we will talk about the future. So are there currently any plans or projects in the pipeline that will disrupt the market? Once again, that you can share with us. Yeah. Maybe you can start with Clarence first. Um, from our end, we always uh, look at the conveniency, right? Because uh, when things goes on, uh, in life, there are so much more complicated things happening around. So how can we actually simplify uh, the process flow, even just the vertical of the logistic and courier services? 
So getting the connecting points done uh, within uh, certain zones, certain areas, uh, these are the key things that we always wanted to focus on, like working together with like convenience stores, like uh, 7-Eleven, My News, 99 Speed Mart, even uh, Caltex and the rest of it. So th this is all, all part of the pieces where how can we actually build the network together and share it among all the players and uh, as our partners. So instantly, once you have all these convenience points, um, you can actually create a network for uh, even greater use of uh, the conveniency for partners like our, our courier service providers. And at the same time, uh, a lot of our retail uh, partners, uh, people who is actually running shops uh, on as a retail front, storefront, a lot of them is actually suffering because of a uh, pandemic. So we actually receive a lot of inquiries and, and see how can we actually help them in this particular portion. So this is actually not the future. It's already happening now, as in uh, what we have been doing to see how can we help the ecosystem uh, during the tough time. What's your view on this, Daryl? Um, so I think in terms of hype plan and also um, we, you know, just touching a little bit about what I mentioned earlier in terms of data, right? So I think we work with a lot of partners to actually um, try to utilize all this data and enrich and to use it for financing purposes. So one thing that I can share recently that we've uh, announced is actually our partnership uh, with uh, Silnet as well as some banks. Uh, so that actually what we plan to do is actually have what we call an intra-regional trade across all Southeast Asia to actually use this trading data uh, to actually help finance. So it goes back to cat based uh, bread and butter where you know, we always talk about how we can actually improve the whole supply chain finance and trade finance process. So we're actually using um, the data from Sealnet, which is um, um, where they actually get a lot of like import export data from the immigration office and so on. And actually based on that kind of data, how can we actually finance um, some of these you know, importers, exporters, um, even the logistic providers, the shippers, and so on. So that's a market that has not really been penetrated um, to, uh, by, by traditional banks. So I think with the whole advent of uh, data and digitalization, I think it's, it's quite right. And, and you know, as Malaysia being a center, okay, Singapore is also uh, one of the regional hubs, but like Malaysia, you'd be surprised that it actually uh, controls, you know, uh, in, in, in the whole second, third, and fourth in terms of, you know, cross border trade across ASEAN. So um, we may say Malaysia and Indonesia, Malaysia and Singapore, Malaysia and Thailand. I think those are actually in the top five uh, regional in terms of like volume of uh, imports and exports. So that's something that we really want to go into. And I think um, so when we think about it, like it could be as simple as uh, once you have a trade um, you, with a simple click of a button, um, you know, either through Sealnets or cap based portal, um, you can actually request fin financing and actually get financing to actually pay uh, for that trade. So I think that's something that um, we are envisioning and actually moving um, closer towards the whole cross-border international trade. Um, yeah. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, how about you, Rico? Um, I'll just talk on the future of um, financial world, I was supposed yeah. uh, with the disruption that um, cryptography and blockchain technology has brought to the, to the world in the last 12 years to 13 years. Um, the currency such as Bitcoin has been uh, established in such a short period of time, being used globally. And uh, with the announcement of uh, El Salvador making Bitcoin their country's uh, legal currency, uh, a lot more countries will start towards moving to this shift where the central bank will announce that Bitcoin will be their legal currency as well to reduce their threat from America or China or all this greater power in the house that trying to control them using US dollar and forcing them to use that. Um, in UAE area, the oil money, 40% has to be reserved as US dollar, which is why they are not happy with it. Like whatever money they make, 40% has to be still stuck in US dollar. So, mm -hmm. it's so a lot of things will change uh, in the next couple of years where we see the adoption of you know digital currencies coming up. Some countries are going to launch their own sovereign um, digital currency. China has took the lead. They have launched their own digital EUN um, as part of their initial project was to promote um, their funds, uh, the one back one road fund to build infrastructure for other countries. They were having a problem because they were losing a lot of US dollar as they go overseas to give funding to sovereign countries. So that is now 
the event get them more control of how their own digital event could be used by their people. At the same time, it could be used as a global currency to other countries and sovereign countries and central bank direct settlement and, and things like that. So we see a lot of um, future um, directions where a lot of digital banks are coming up. Their operation expenses are definitely lower than the current bank uh, architecture. So a lot of banks will start shrinking the operations moving to self-administered services through an app or online banking. Um, banking will be downsizing the operations. Um, that's what we see in the future of the financial. It is happening now, right? <laughs> it's happening yeah. in some countries yeah. already. Right. Right. Um, some banks can't carry on. They have been downsizing, retrenching, right. and also yes. as, a, as a reason of pandemic. But in fact, that share started this long time ago. Yeah. Uh, branches will be closing down and downsizing, yeah. where services can be done on the app or on phone uh, or, or online. So I think that that trend will, will be more significant over the next few years um, as we, we speak. Yeah, Rico, how would you see this uh, big uh, blockchain technology, blockchain technology being used in the business in the near future? I would say the adoption of blockchain technology in the businesses are still very infant stage. I think I don't see any good blockchain architecture or infrastructure that is ready for enterprise solution. There has been many claims and over promises being done by some of these blockchain companies and they failed their proof of concept. They have failed uh, over the last two to three years with many banks. They couldn't solve the problem. They couldn't replace SWIFT. Um, so I would say that uh, blockchain um, as a technology uh, still needs a lot of innovations, a lot of opportunity involved, a lot of opportunities are there that uh, the younger minds can come in to build something on and make it better. So I, I believe that uh, people with computer science, people who are coders are all in demand because the whole world is short of coders for the blockchain community. That's we all are always seeking for talent. So I think um, as, as the technology for businesses are still very infant. Um, stage where if you use it on supply chain to store data on a ledger system or blockchain, this is something very elementary um, level, which can be done already, um, done for tracking of data and, and, and tracking of transactions, too elementary um, for us. In, it's, it can be done already. It's just better of why, why do you need to put it on a blockchain? Why do you need to be transparent and not changeable? If you need it, then you use it. If not, you don't need the blockchain. In a so um, the concept of blockchain is because of decentralization and store of data on different locations and different nodes and to verify it. So that, that could be a proof of work model or a proof of stake model. More, more and more blockchains are moving towards a proof of stake uh, because of the um, transaction speed and the volume and, and, and scalability of it. Um, however, that will also reduce the security level and, and other issues that may come along if they use a stick model that is fast, but you, you are losing on something else, which is security. So I think that is a balance um, of, of the technology that we are looking at to be built in the near future. Um, and and there, are, there are lots of new blockchains or, or, or layer two sort of technologies being built um, at, as we speak. Um, we are involved in many new startups and, start, uh, and new technologies that are building sort of technology in the ecosystem. So I think um, lots of opportunities uh, in the blockchain space um, and, and uh, um, a lot of talents that will be needed in the near future. Thanks, thanks Rico. Yeah, this is a quick question to Clarence. Uh, is Easy Parcel looking to do more than just facilitating deliveries but expanding into other fields, particles that can leverage Easy Parcel's existing capabilities? Yeah, over to you Clarence. Thank you. Thanks Aistan. Um, the answer is definitely yes, uh, even though we already started a, a few smaller projects, uh, like example, even on insurance, it, it's still the backbone is still logistic, but the uh, front end, um, example, when you send a parcel, definitely you need uh, to have an option, right? If you're sending out parcel that's higher value. So how are you going to get the process done by insured that particular parcel? Um, traditionally, all this is pretty manual and it's so hard to actually get a parcel insured. So that is also one can be considered as one of the new vertical that uh, we are also exploring at this stage. And uh, definitely there are still much, much more things that is required. Like for example, all the micro SMEs and how to help them to scale their business. 
like example working with uh, all the uh, platform uh, shopping cart platform um, how to actually help them to set up in uh, their e-commerce stores so all these are still related to like e-commerce vertical uh, rather than just a uh, pure logistic play and uh, at the same time uh, all these are, are still made possible for uh, any any um, uh, any ideas that is uh, open to all yeah, yeah. Thanks to all the panelists. So in terms of for the future, I will summarize in two words, which is convenience and simplified processes. And the digital currency is still on the rise. Blockchain is still in the infancy. Yeah. So if anyone would like to uh, tap into the uh, future technology, I think blockchain will be one of the areas that, that uh, we can look into. Lah. So before we move on to the Q&A session, uh, we would like to take a group photo with all of you. So I call on Miss Soraya, who will be helping to coordinate this. Over to you, Soraya. Sure. Um, thanks, Peter. Hi, everyone. Um, before we move on to the Q&A session, let's take a group photo. Take a break for us, stretch a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much again for joining us. Um, yeah, don't be shy. Yeah, now it's time for, yeah, now is the time for Q&A session by the audience. So um, I have some questions here based on the RSVP form. Um, what are the main skills that young generation should start practicing in order to quickly adapt with the vastly changing environment? Yeah, any of the panelists would like to take on this question? Maybe Daryl would like to try. Uh, sorry, I actually missed the question. Could you, uh, oh, could you repeat uh, the question? Yeah, what are the main skills that the young generation should start practicing uh, in order to quickly adapt with the vastly changing environment that we are facing today? Uh, okay, that's interesting. I think. Um, I think for, for me, I think having that passion in terms of like understanding and, and actually really going deep into the roots of what, what you're doing, I, I think that that's quite crucial. Um, you really have to have uh, to really understand. And that's something that, at least for, for me, in terms of like hiring, um, that the whole passion and like drive to actually, you know, curiosity, actually go really deep into something and actually understand it so that, you know, when you want to converse and all, you actually are kind of like a subject matter as well. I mean, um, all of us would have uh, experience, but more often than not, like um, it may not actually be as deep. So um, we, I think when when the the candidates actually uh, stand out for me are actually those that um, actually you know can tell that this guy actually really have that drive, um, actually goes really deep, and you know just just love what he does. Um, so I think that that's uh, uh, one of the key things I would say. Like you know just having that passion and drive and and being inquisitive and just just uh, being open to learning and, and absorbing as much as you can, especially at, at a young stage, right? Because even for me, when I first started out, like I didn't know that I'm gonna end up here. So I think just having, being open to, to check, to change and uh, being uh, inquisitive actually helps. Uh. Yep, thanks Daryl. Rico, any comment from your side? Um, from my past experience of, um hiring and looking at the talents who I think one of the things that I value the most um, for the young talents are actually problem solving solutions, solving skills. Um, and then the next will be people skills, how they are interacting with the colleagues, um, the people around them, you know, are they confident enough to speak and, and all these things. And that that is a sort of way that I look at how they will actually accelerate in the job if, if they are able to solve problems for the companies. Number one, they are they're qualified. Number two, they have good attitude towards people around them. And uh, I, I also agree with what Darren Ang said earlier on that um, it's all about passion. If you're passionate about something, you know, you will do it regardless of what is the cost or whatever approach you use. So I think that passion is important. If you can see the passion uh, in that person, I think that is uh, definitely a bonus. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Rico. Um, Clarence, do you have anything to share with us regarding um, this? I think from our end, is quite similar. Um, how we actually look at talent is rather than looking at their skill set, we also look at the mindset and then the mentality 
um, I think I think these two two play a very important role in every session that we we actually run through during the interview because with the right attitude you can always learn a lot of things that you never knew before right so like uh, what um, Daryl and also my background we don't really have anything uh, like mine uh, mine for example I don't really have anything uh, related to what we have been doing right so it's it's all down to what makes you excited every day in doing what you do I think that is something the important when we look at the talent and uh, why you wanted to go for this role is it because of uh, we are in pink or is it something else right that makes you excited every day so that will be a long long thing a long long terms of a, a scenario rather than just uh, how much we can offer you um, then you can compare with abc it's not yeah. just about that right yeah thanks thanks clarence there's this uh, question to cap bay uh, we record low opr and banks hung hungry to grow their assets do you see this as a threat to your p2p financing model yeah, uh, thanks. Thank you, Sam, for the question. Quite interesting question. Um, in fact, I would say it is actually contrary. So in the past, what we've seen from the GFC, the Global Financial Crisis in 2008, um, that was actually the genesis of the access of um, quite a lot of uh, B2B financing platforms. Um, because, you know, with record uh, low rates um, and with a credit crunch, you know, for both sides of the platform in, in terms of like um, investors looking for higher um uh, than higher uh, returns compared to the fixed deposits of like you know sub to one two percent and separate uh, and on the other side um, just the whole credit crunch model right banks aren't really traditional banks aren't really lending to to the uh, borrowers um, that actually creates a very big market for um, uh, both sides of the platform and actually that actually helps to kickstart quite a lot of uh, the P2P platforms. So I wouldn't say that um, this is a trap. Per se. I think, in fact, I see it more as an opportunity la, and actually a catalyst to, for a lot of the P2P platforms. La. And I think the key now is then, you know, how, how do the P2P platforms differentiate, right? Because definitely you see a lot more credit risk involved. So I think for us, we've uh, been very focused in terms of like ensuring our credit, um, uh, we, we, our credit underwriting standards are at, uh, high quality rate line and actually issue out good quality investment notes. Thanks, Daryl. Mm -hmm. There's this question uh, to the panelists. Uh, so how does you how do you see ESG fits into the picture? How does it affect your ventures and are you doing anything in relation to it? Any point want to I think uh, I'm deeply involved in this sector because we were looking at a lot of impact projects and uh, green technologies, health tech, um, environmental friendly tech, and, and yep. the way business mm -hmm. for the sake of creating a better um, environment for the next generation and removing pollutions. So I, I gave an example of earlier on with the artisan um, gold mining operations shift. Um, where they actually raise funds to cryptocurrencies through, during uh, ICO time and investing into buying tools to help the miners uh, call ops in those countries to actually mine gold uh, more efficiently and removing um, the mercury. Along the line, they also implemented supply chain management to monitor along the process because one of the major problems in the whole gold mine is people stealing gold along the process of mining, right? So that monitoring system is very important. The United Nations is looking at that, uh, SDGs, all these things are changing the way a uh, lifestyle and bringing, making their life better for the miners at the grassroots level. Um, on the green energy side, there, there have been a lot of talking uh, in the space about the unbanked community. There are 1.7 billion people on earth that do not have access to banking solutions. They don't have a bank account, 1.7 billion people. So if we can bring in the technology to this current banking system with these people, and they will be starting using you know, this sort of technology, it will be very disruptive and they will be definitely jumping across the board suddenly they have the latest tech. And the way they operate, their lifestyle will change significantly for these people. So I think that's a lot of project that we are working on, are looking along this line. One of the things that I would like to highlight is that in our space, we are constantly looking at a uh, decentralized um, authority organization structure. We call it a DAO structure. 
because in our space we can actually issue token and we can let the token holders be a voter the more tokens you have the more votes you can cast when it comes to a decision making for the business or the ecosystem or the community the token holders actually act as like a shareholders of concept where they can actually vote for something when the decision is being posed to them like if we do a b or c which one do you vote for so that DAO um, concept of governance structure that we have for more businesses coming up in the tech space is getting a lot of traction and getting a lot of popularity and you know, constantly innovating ways of making um, decisions more efficiently and more market driven rather than someone making decisions on top and doesn't know the problems on a grassroots level. So that, that itself could be a balancer in terms of making better decisions for the, for the market and building solutions and solving problems for the people at the grassroots level. Um, I think these sort of things are the, some of the trends that we are looking at. Uh, also from Nicholas, uh, one of the questions that you asked for, um, the health tech with blockchain um, technology merging together. Um, yes and no. Um, a lot of health tech solutions are growing faster than blockchain technology, if you're very um, while the company that we investors were actually uh, doing um, human stem cell manufacturing um, from mesen mesenthermal stem cell, MSC stem cells, and using the, um, them to treat people and regenerate their, their health and improving their immune systems. We also have uh, a technology that the investor that, that uses natural killer cells to improve the immune system to fight different diseases, including cancers. So a lot of tech are actually evolving very quickly with or without blockchain. A, a misconception in your space is people misconcept that using blockchain to fundraise as a crowdfunding approach, like what I mentioned earlier, using initial digital offering, using initial coin offering, it's just a fundraising mechanism that has been used on a token. It's not the technology of blockchain itself. You know, applying blockchain technology into businesses in the health tech requires a lot more things. And as I mentioned earlier on today, I don't see a good blockchain infrastructure that is able to support big volume of transactions and, and a lot of activities on this blockchain or the blockchain will go down or the PPP is too expensive. It's not realistic to build on it. So I think we are still in the search of a good blockchain architecture and solution that can be used for enterprise level. Um, and, and of course, it will be used across all verticals, health pay and health tech information sharing. Uh, there are many projects that actually can build um, doctor to use or concept where you know your health records for you from the day you were born until now are stored in one location so you have access to this information digitally but coming back to the problem that I think Clarence also mentioned are the doctors using digital data are the input being put in as a digital information are they still using papers to write you know memos or notes of what your health condition are is this whole process being digitized yet? And, and this is very important because if your doctor doesn't know how to use the iPad or things to write details <laughs> into a system, how is your data being stored digitally? And it has to be done manually to scan something that that, that itself doesn't make sense. So it's, it has to do with the people in the industry learning and actually adopting the technology and using the technology before we can move to the next stage of say having AI data business intelligence to actually know your health condition better. Moving forward, quantum genetics, you know, that can analyze your DNA and your whole, you know, heritage sort of data. If you have a, a very concise um, analysis about your gene, those are things that are happening now already in the healthcare. But that has nothing to do with blockchain. So I think um, conclusion, I think, uh, yes, um, there may be some tech that use blockchain but it doesn't mean that all tech must use blockchain, especially in the healthcare sector. Thank you. Thank you, Rico. We have this uh, question to Cat Bay. Uh, how do you remain competitive given that there are so many P2P players popping up now? Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, with, without doubt, like I think everyone uh, would have competitors along the way. Um, so I think for us, what we try and do is actually we remain true to our niche. So I think, um, and SE has been conscious about this in terms of like 
uh, ensuring that you know the BTPs in Malaysia um, have their own sort of space. Uh, um, the other players, you know, for example, look at more long term, uh, whereas we look at more of the supply chain, finance, and short term kind of notes. So um, what we do and also uh, is also ultimately uh, ensure that we stay true to our offering in terms of like ensuring you know it's high quality notes and actually giving that uh, full customer service to to the investors um, and also on the flip side on the best, uh, on the issuer side i.e the borrowers uh, we ensure that you know our rates are sustainable uh, we always. Um, uh, improving the whole process in terms of the convenience and, and I think uh, we've seen a lot of our 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 customers who uh, has been with us uh, for a very long time even though they've kind of grown uh, their size and I think that's what we uh, try and do where you know when we finance we think about you know how can we actually extend um, the whole relationship uh, so that we can grow together with them because I think you know financing is definitely a tool or at least that note to actually grow the business further um, so we would very much like to see that whole journey uh, with the customer. And, and I think maybe just to touch a little bit about the ESG part, I think so for CatBay, we do um, have quite a bit of programs that actually touch uh, some of the underbanked and unserved uh, market where, for example, you know, there's a partnership that we did with the Bori. Um, so these are some um, sole proprietors, you know, they don't really have bank accounts, as people mentioned, you know, part of the 1.7 billion, um, and they don't really have much transaction data. But I think with our partnership with Delori, uh, we actually enable um, some of these transactions because um, we actually can use some of the data provided by the Delori's platform to actually finance it. Uh, so this is part of uh, a project that we did with uh, UNCDF in terms of like, you know, solving their, their, their goals, the sustainable goals. Um, so I think, you know, with, with the whole FinTech solution, I think everyone is, is trying to solve, you know, different areas. And I think there is some element of like customization for, you know, each target segment. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Daryl. So uh, this question that I would like to pose to Clarence uh, and Daryl and Rico as well. So I will start off with Clarence. There's this question on how to kickstart a business while we are still working on a permanent job. Do you have some advice for them? <laughs> I think a scenario now versus 10 years ago, 11 years ago when I first uh, started um, as an entrepreneur is very, very different now. Right? Um, yeah. With a lot of resources is available. Um, a lot of support is actually available in the market. Mm. Um, I always uh, advise as in, uh, you don't really have to make a, a, a strong choice that, oh, tomorrow onwards, I need to become an entrepreneur to start a business rather than uh, you can actually keep both, right? At least uh, a lot of our, our, even our team members, we even uh, advise them to, you can start doing part-time selling online. At least you feel the market first, you feel the, the, the problem, you feel the solution directly before you make the final call as in, I really need to jump to the other side. So the scenario is totally different today versus 10 years ago. A lot of option is actually available. So you don't really have to make the hard call. I, I have to be going there or stay here. So you can actually do both test the water, at least for you to actually feel, is that something that you really wanted to venture for the next three to five years? Because being an entrepreneur to start something is not just for a week, it's a very long-term period and the responsibility, taking up uh, families and care, I think it's a long, long-term period. I, in the early days, um, when we first started from a team of five, I will never expect I'm having a team of 500 now. 500 families oh. actually under our care, right? So it's not just a yes or no thing. I want to do it now. At least you have a feel, test the temperature, test the water before you make the choice. And 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 with the pandemic nowadays, uh, you still a lot. You still have a lot of option now, right? Yep. Yep. Ho yeah. Hopefully, it doesn't confuse them further. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's a very encouraging with your advice. Yeah. Daryl, do you want to share? Yeah. I, I think, you know, Clarence uh, hit, it on, uh, hit the nail on its head. I think maybe just to add, I think, um, add on is, um, think, if you think about like 10 years ago, right? Like, uh, I don't think uh, if I was in a similar position, I don't think I would have the same access and opportunities as, as it was 10 years ago. Reason being, I think, you know, you go knocking on the door to some company, large company, they'll be like, who are you? Like, you know, they, please talk to my, you can talk to my executive assistant 
to set up a meeting with one of my juniors. <laughs> Whereas now, um, there's a lot more opportunity, there's a, more, a lot more um, openness to achieve uh, startups. And, and now, you know, we, we've uh, been in talks with, you know, the companies, the management, the C level management, and also um, there, there is a lot more open, uh, there's a lot more opportunities and, and receptiveness uh, to a lot of the startups. I think, um, again, it goes back to your passion and, and uh, whether your uh, solution actually uh, solves a, 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 a big problem that uh, these guys have. Thanks, thanks. Rico? Uh, for myself, I started my first job as an entrepreneur after I finished mm-hmm. my degree in, I think uh, most of you do not know my background yet. I come from a Bachelor of Science in Psychology background. Wow. And, and I switched to do my Master's in Supply Chain Management. Um, before I did psychology, I was doing e engineering for about two years. So I had a huge career change after I went to do my internship in the power plant in uh, Parker in, in the East Coast. And I realized that this is not my cup of tea. I came out in the working around as engineer in the power plant, uh, reading all these codes and, and things, control systems, and that's not my cup of tea. So I realized that I'm a, I'm a people person and I switched to study psychology and I transferred all my credits and the rest was history. And after I finished my, my studies in psychology, I was focusing a lot on ergonomics, human factors, psychology, on, on cross-cultural changing and, and improving efficiency in human organizations. So that was my focus in psychology. So I realized that it was very business focused. My interest was more business. And uh, so I realized one thing, everything we do in human is about knowledge, is about data. and um, and how do you transfer this data across the whole supply chain? I think every entrepreneur is having this problem. I train someone. How can I train this skill set to the next person who is going to take over? How to make this a family business or conglomerate that can run the business for 100 years, 200 years? The transformation of data was something that was very keen, which is why I went and studied some supply chain management. It's, it's a, under the school of information system. It's about having the pipeline of data transferring from every single value chain it's like transferring knowledge from another person to another person. Um, that's how I view the whole supply chain or, or, and applying this concept of supply chain uh, management into different businesses. And, and the skill sets I've learned from the news leads are still being applied every day in my life. When I talk to people, I apply psychology. Uh, how do I understand people? How do I talk to people heart to heart sort of thing and, and understanding people's need and want and passion, the attitude using those analysis. And those are things that I apply every day when I talk to people. Um, when I come to business side of things, I view everything as a supply chain because it's procurement, logistics, movement of funds, everything, total cost of ownership of a business. How to do it just in time, how to make it more efficient, more lean to save costs for a business. So applying all these skill sets um, is where I'm applying it now in, in coaching, in incubation, in fundraising, in, in due diligence <laughs> across the board, in everything I do, I applied the knowledge. So I think for, for the young talents out here and those who are listening, follow your heart, you know, follow your heart and understand what you really want in your life because it's a, it's a lifelong process that you will be changing your mind, you, ex- you explore new things, your perception change, but something never change. You know, it's what you want to achieve in your lifetime. So that question is always out there. While you're still so searching for that, you can work for someone and, and learn new skills and then you discover some new things, new talents about yourself. Um, that's not necessarily that you have to be an entrepreneur. I actually went back to become a corporate guy after I cashed out on my first business because I, I felt that lack of corporate experience in me after I, I've been an entrepreneur for six years. So I went back to work for a chairman of a company and I reported to him and I was a CEO. But that was a, a very important factor in my life that I realized that I need to know how to manage a company in a corporate way in the public company's approach. So I feel the need and that's something lacking in me uh, compared to being an entrepreneur myself, scaling the business like what Clarence did from one person to 500. It's a totally different thing from where he started. I believe that, you know, he has learned a lot and he has a team to help him manage the business. And you can be part of his team, such as a big company like that. And doesn't mean that you have to be the owner. 
And because of you doing well, people like Canvas valuing your effort. They might offer you share in the company to keep you. So a lot of structures are in place to make sure that, you know, there's a place for everyone. As long as you show that you have the right attitude, the passion for what you're doing, go for it. Yep. Thanks. Thanks, Rico. Um, this is the last question for today uh, of, to all the panelists. How are you coping with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of your business and in terms of your personal life? Yeah. Perhaps our parents would like to kick start um, with this uh, question. I think business-wise, uh, I've shared uh, quite a fair bit of it like yeah. earlier on in the session. Right? So I'll talk about uh, more on my personal as an individual. Yes. Um, before pandemic, 80% uh, of my time, a lot of people, when they ask me, hey, where you are staying? Um, my answer is in the airport. So 80% <laughs> of my time is actually traveling. And then uh, I haven't been traveling for the past two years since uh, uh, even way before early days of the pandemic. And then um, I think that is uh, the best moment that I had because uh, finally my son know who is his dad. And uh, <laughs> and, and uh, my, my son is actually eight years old now. So most of the time, he don't really know where's his dad because he's always flying around everywhere right, for business. So I think that is the most uh, cherished moment that I ever had um, throughout the pandemic. Although yes, time is tough. Um, I don't even have the chance to meet uh, my team. Uh, everyone have to back up. Uh, I have, have to actually do even more uh, as in what we have been doing. Uh, a lot of them, they, they actually suffered like normal days. You, you, you have the chance to clock out in the office, right? But when you started work from home and especially in the logistic and industry, e-commerce industry, the customer don't sleep, right? So, so it, it goes back to like how, how challenging is every team member has over the pandemic. Everyone has to work extra hard uh, to, to actually help in, in uh, the, all the respective uh, perspective. Uh. And um, I, I, as in a person, definitely I cherish the moment and definitely that will help us to fill myself up um, for the next challenge, even uh, when the borders open. I definitely know, um, yes, of course, Zoom will be there, but um, human to human touch is always very, very important because end of the day, we are human, right? So the touch will always be very, very important. And I definitely know I'll be going back to flying when the, the time actually allows. And um, just, I, I really cherish the moment uh, over the past two years that I had to, to be really stay at home and then uh, spend the most of the time with the families that I never had the chance to do it over the past 11 years. Wow. Thanks, thanks, parents. Uh, over to you, Daryl. <laughs> I think again, Charles probably captured most of it. <laughs> really. uh, like, um, yeah, similarly, I think my experience, like a lot of the times, like uh, it's a lot of like uh, client meetings and so on, you know, pre, pre COVID. Um, whereas now, yeah, unfortunately, with the whole uh, COVID situation, that, that thing has to cut, I think it's a lot more virtual interaction, which personally, I, I don't think it's the best, uh, but you know, you've got to make do. Uh, ultimately, that human interaction is, is missing, and, and that's kind of uh, how, how you kind of get a lot of views done. Uh, not not just like getting to know someone, but also through interacting, you know, networking sessions, you could just pop into some one of those random networking sessions and then, you know, you meet someone and then you realize, uh, oh, you know, similar interest, maybe you can do some some transaction or deal. Uh, whereas now, unfortunately, it's quite limited. Like, and, you know, virtual space is, is a bit different. Like, I mean, if you randomly message someone, they might wonder, you know, who are you? As opposed to like, just, just like, you know, you see someone physically, you just, uh, hello, you know, my name is Daryl. Um, then, then that's much better. So the whole, the whole, just you know, business aside, like the whole uh, uh, personal interaction that has definitely um, decreased a lot. So I think you know, from a mental health perspective, also that's something that um, we try and ensure uh, not just uh, uh, for person, but also a lot of our our staff. So um, they can get it can get to them where you know sometimes they feel a bit lonely and then. Um, again, like <laughs> like what Clarence mentioned, uh, now it's like kind of round the clock, right? Like sometimes I try not to message after work hours, but sometimes you know, not not just me, but like sometimes the clients and all would, would kind of try like you know message lah. So um, like taking care of that that whole mental health situation and, and you know ensuring that everyone is is um, sound and, and you know taken well taken care of, you know the family and all. I think uh, that's important lah. And, and uh, I think very similar to Clarence again. Um, 
managed to spend quite a bit of time with my son. La. <laughs> I, I don't know whether you guys could hear him crying just now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so that actually is, I guess, one of the plus side um, in terms of like you know being working from home a lot, uh, getting to spend a bit of time. Like uh, back then, you know, I'll be in the office. Uh, whereas now, you know, sometimes I can just pop, pop, pop outside and then you know just uh, uh, spend some time with uh, my son. Yeah, I agree. Great, great. How about Rico? So for me, it's a bit different. Um, I will share with you guys personally later now. Because I, I was just found to be uh, positive with COVID yesterday. Oh, man. And, uh, it was my 18th day after I, I had symptoms. So um, so I, I didn't realize I went to COVID. I thought it was a dry cough sort of thing. And then, well, then my partner got infected and he said he lost his taste. I was like, hey, I didn't lose my taste but at all for the last 18 days. But he's lost his taste but, and we are sa- living together together in the same apartment in Dubai now. So, okay, that's not a good sign. Let's do a PCR test. And we got a result last night and we are both positive. And he's at his seven days, I'm at my 18 day. Um, so he's still a bit suffering there, trying to recover. But I think I've got um, with a lot of breaths and, 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 and drinking a lot of fluids. And uh, but I, I still went through antibiotic treatment because the doctor gave me the wrong treatment. So I'm still recovering with that while taking more vitamins and, and um, taking a uh, ivermectin tablets as recommended by some of the doctors. So that's for me for personally COVID-19 has affected me. I lost about one week of my uptime because I was down <laughs> and uh, recovering from it. I survived it. Um, and for, for my businesses, I realized that same as, as, as Clarence and many entrepreneurs, we have been flying around, uh, living in airports, living in hotels and Airbnbs and much around the world. And, and then we have very little time with the family and, and family time. Um, I, I never seen my parents for around two years uh, until last year I moved back from China and stayed back in Kuala Lumpur for until like May. So it was like a 14 month stay back with the parents. Um, it was an eye opener. I haven't been that long staying with my parents to get under one roof for so many years and getting to know them better and understand their health uh, and, and the condition, how their lifestyle is, what they do and everything under one roof and teaching them how to use crypto, how to buy Bitcoin and all those things to my dad is interesting moment. Uh, and he started asking me what you do actually. <laughs> huh? Bitcoin? What is it? Uh, is everyone talking about it? What is this Dogecoin? Uh, you know, <laughs> how is it related to it? All these funny, funny things start coming out every day. And, and it's fun and it's interesting. It was a very... Um, treasured moment for me myself um, to actually get to know my parents and, and they understand me better. Oh, you've been doing this all the while. Oh, okay. We didn't know that. We didn't know what you were doing actually. We understand what you were doing. <laughs> Those sort of things. So that that interactive band and time was was very valuable to me. Um, in fact, then they realized as, as I was at home, they realized I walked around the clock because of all the Zoom calls globally. I literally only sleep like three to four hours a day because I was working around the clock globally with all the Zoom calls. We got more Zoom calls before than traveling to meet people. And we got more time to rest if we go and do business trip because we normally sit seven, six to seven hours. But now, all the pandemic lockdown, we had no time to sleep because we were having too many Zoom calls back to back. Um, that That's what I experienced um, personally. And we got even more busier and people were like just you need to use Calendly to start setting appointment because it's just overwhelmed. Uh, and because of the time zone differencing and uh, differences and calculating the time zone, we need to use tool to, to manage all those things. So it was an interesting moment. Uh, and then in May, I decided to travel to Dubai for a conference and uh, invited as a speaker uh, in the Artificial Intelligence Blockchain Summit. And after coming back here, I, was, uh, and I saw all the things going back in Malaysia. I was, okay. I'm going to stay here for the time being. Um, so I've been living in Dubai for the last two months. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of conferences are going on. The World Expo is, the Dubai Expo is happening in October. Bars, everything are all open. So I don't know how I got infected, actually, <laughs> along the way. I've been meeting a lot of people for the last two months. Um, some people got infected. Some people got very badly hit. Some people got just a, a cold or a fever for two days. It all varies. So I think that's how um, I'm dealing with COVID personally. And, and, and this is life, I suppose. And we just make do our best and to survive it, I, I suppose. Yeah. 
Wishing you a speedy recovery, uh, Rico. I'm I'm quite recovered actually. Um, two days ago I was still coughing. Today I haven't coughed yet, so wow. you are strong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um. Thank you, everyone, for your great questions, like, and thank you to our panelists as well. It has been a pleasure speaking with all of you, and I really enjoyed the discussion. I'll hand the time back to our host, Husna. Over to you, Husna. Uh, thank you, Peter, Clarice, Daryl, and Rico. Uh, it's an interesting sharing session. And to me personally, I think it's a good call to have a shift in paradigm of how we work, um, how we do business, and even how we make money, you see? Um, I'm sorry to hear about your, your I know, Rico, about you getting um, COVID-19, but I hope speedy recovery for you and family. Uh, we're already reaching 7.30 now, so I mean, in just to respect everybody's time uh, and the panelists' time as well, the, the breakout session is not happening, but I'm quite happy. I think everybody's happy. There's a lot of Q&A going on. Um, a lot of Q&A questions has also been covered, so I think that's, that's good. Um, and so we will end this here. Uh, thank you so much again to all the panelists, uh, Peter. Uh, Clarence, Daryl, Rico, for your time and to everybody who, who joined us today, thank you very much. Um, you know, stay safe and take care. Thank you, thank you. Stay safe, everyone. Thanks all. Stay safe, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Get vaccinated. <laughs> <laughs>